Hammond stands guard over the entrance to Happy Valley, and it has been just that for Penn State lacrosse this year. Unbeaten at home, they look to stay that way against Princeton, the Ivy League champs. We wrap up a great first round of NCAA lacrosse action coming up next here on ESPNU. Take a look at our bracket. It's starting to fill out here a little bit in terms of the quarterfinals. Duke just beat Delaware. They advance to take on Michigan. They continue to surprise that Saturday in Albany. Sunday in Annapolis, Army awaits the winner of our game here, the final game of the weekend. Let's look at the bottom half of the bracket. It's all complete. Notre Dame and Hopkins, Sunday in Annapolis, Georgetown, Virginia, Saturday in Albany. Hello, everybody, alongside the great Paul Carcaterra. I'm Chris Cotter. We wrap things up. What a weekend we Oof. have had. And these two teams, when you think about Princeton and Penn State, I think in February, nobody would have guessed these two would have been playing today. Nobody. All Penn State did was triple their wins from a season ago and win the Big Ten regular season championship. Princeton, Cotter, has been playing single elimination lacrosse for the last month. Six starters out for the season with injuries. The next man up mentality for Matt Madelon and staff has been incredible. Well, the next man up for them has been Jake Stevens, among others. The Canadian, the senior, clearly has filled a gap. The most versatile and maybe the most valuable player for the Princeton Tigers. He could play man down, play wings on a face-off. Last week in the Ivy Championship against Yale, he was a perfect six for six shooting. When you put him on the extra man or you play him inside, he lights it up with a quick release. The Canadian, I think, will be a pro for 10 years. TJ Malone's the quarterback for Penn State and Jeff Tambroni. He is a dealer. He passes the rock with efficiency. And if you play him just as a passer, he could beat you as a goal scorer, too. He's the Big Ten offensive player of the year. Think about what Stevens and Malone have done, the accolades and the production. It's been off the chart for both of them. Both Princeton and Penn State are going to need huge games from them today if they want to advance to the quarters next weekend. Goalies, we're going to see two of the top goalies in all of college lacrosse and two of the hottest netminders as well. When you think about Michael Gianfrancaro, who was the MVP of the Ivy League tournament last weekend, second in the country in save percentage, going up against Jack Frassion, first team All Big Ten goalie, third in the country in that same category. Teammates call him Geo. Big save ability. He took over New York in the Ivy Championships a week ago. It was absolutely fantastic. And Frassion is a junkie of a goalie in terms of always wants shots, always wants to play. His demeanor never changes. These are two of the brightest young stars in college lacrosse at the position. Face-off X is going to be big. Both teams come in under 50%. Chase Mullins for Penn State, Andrew McMeekin for, for uh, Princeton going to take the draw, and we're underway. Immediately, a face-off violation is going to go against Penn State, so it'll be Princeton ball. Coach Matt Madelon in his seventh full season as the head coach at Princeton, having to move a lot of pieces around, as you said, Clark. So we'll see some players in some positions, maybe at the start of this game, that we're not used to seeing. Sean Cameron we're used to seeing at that midfield spot. Coach says he's a special shooter on the run, not getting an angle on this time, though. Coulter Mackesee. He's the player to keep an eye on in black. 91. Draws a lot of attention, as you would expect from all the white shirts. Princeton will move the ball around and get a shot. Bounces around in front of the crease, but doesn't harm anybody. This Penn State defense, Cotter, is fast, aggressive, and strong. You feel their presence. Look out here. Oh, you can see that collision coming, but Penn State is still able to keep possession. Mark Sickler. Shows the athleticism and keeping the ball at his cross. Now Kevin Winkoff, 48, will give way to Matt Trainer, one of the Trainer brothers, the younger of the two. Jack Trainer starts in attack number 16 in white. Matt Costin gets open in the middle of the field, opts not to take a shot, instead passes it off on the wing. That's TJ Malone, he's the quarterback. Over to Trainer. Now back behind the cage to Winkoff. Winkoff doesn't have an angle. Up top to Costin. 
Malone again looking to dodge. He loses control. And eventually it's picked up in the crease by John Ficaro. Marquez White clears it for the Tigers and they'll settle up to 6v6 again. This is the matchup from an attack defensive perspective. Coulter Mackesy, number four in the nation, points per game against Jack Posey, who's been a lockdown defender for Jeff Tambroni this year. Posey's second team, all Big Ten, number 43. Princeton bounces it home. Talked about the shooting ability of Sean Cameron on display there. He beats Frassion. And he's two-handed. And when you watch him on tape, he rarely shoots these high bouncers. Gets Frassion off guard. But this is an incredible shot using the turf and pinging the upper left corner for a goaltender to track that. Especially with a shooter like Cameron who loves to keep the ball high. 16th goal of the year for the sophomore from Bedford, New Hampshire. Another violation this time. It's gonna go against Princeton. Three violations and a half, and it's an automatic 30-second penalty for every ensuing violation. So it's big that both teams have one in the first three minutes of this game. Malone's working on Colin Mulshine, number 43. So that's a matchup to keep an eye on. Over to Trainer. Uses a pick. Jump shot. He bounces it high, and it's off the top crossbar. Malone couldn't get the rebound. Still fighting for it. Now we get a whistle, and there'll be a turnover. What's with all these old school bouncers, right? right. Utilizing the turf here at, at uh, Panzer Stadium. When you look at this matchup, expect physicality. Both teams have short stick defensive midfield units that are super strong athletes that will get after you in the middle of the field. This game will be physical. Mackesee. Second midfield unit on now for Prince. That's Tommy Barnes. Working on the shorty, can't get anywhere with it. Dumphy. Behind the cage, Coulter Mackesee. You can hear the pads popping as Mackesee comes upfield. Still 20 seconds to shoot. Off the pipe. That'll reset the shot clock to 60. Princeton more than happy to run a little clock here. Extend this defensive possession for Penn State. Sickler. Trying to stay on him defensively. Slusher. Mackesy now will look to dodge. The ball in his left hand, but a nice job by Grant Haas. Also, Big Ten short stick the midi. He shoots and scores, though. Mackesy still beats him. Look at that Princeton bench. Some guys just have the confidence of a legit goal scorer. That's one right there. 91 in black, Coulter Mackesee. Took the Ivy League by storm this season, scoring in bunches, has had two eight goal games. And I love what Princeton does offensively moving him around. He's an attackman, you'll see him up top, sometimes the highest player in the set, to take a defender out of his comfort zone, and he's always shot ready. 50th on the year for Mackesee. McMeekin and Mullins once again. Ball pops straight up in the air. Kicked around and won by Penn State. Still with Penn State. Frassion makes a one-handed catch. 
This ride is ferocious here by Princeton. Nice job of clearing by Penn State initially, but the ball's on the carpet. Princeton won it back. This Princeton team has heart. In a little bit of trouble here, though. Get a timeout? Yeah, we did. Matt Madelon knew his player was in a lot of trouble. Called the timeout. Wants to talk things over. Has to be happy with his team's performance on the road. Up 2-0 here in our final first-round matchup in the lacrosse tournament. There's Princeton head coach Matt Madelon led the Tigers to championship weekend last year. You mentioned to Cork in the open all the injuries he's had to deal with. What did they do in the last month of the year? Basically faced must win every single game. They won the Ivy League tournament to get here. He's a phenomenal coach and he's not in a situation where he could utilize the transfer portal with the Ivy League and he's lost players as fifth years graduate transfers elsewhere. And Jeff Tambroni talk about answering the bell in 2023 three wins a season ago gets nine triples it big 10 regular season champs and when we talked to him this week he said he and his staff this off season were all in he was on the road almost every single day last summer yeah he didn't want to go into this season with any doubt knowing that they put every ounce into this season he and his staff and his wife michelle who was a big time athlete here at Penn State as well. She bought in too and said well, at the end of last season, let's just go ahead and do it. Let's spend the off season getting better and they got a lot better. Holding up play here a little bit. Lucas Stanit, just making sure the shot clock is in the right spot as Stanit puts it in play for Princeton. Here we go. Stan at 6-4. Initially loses the ball, but gets it back. Look at the size differential. Stan it on Haas. Mackesy trying to use a pick. Gets a step. Shoots too high. You're going to see Posey, 43 and white, flush Mackesy to his right hand. He is a big time, two handed lefty cradle guy. But he's shown over the course of the second half of the season, he could score, especially around goal line extended with those low angles with his offhand. Our officials making sure once again that the clock is synced up to where they need it to be. Joe Cislack, Jeffrey Hoffman, and Jason McGinn, our officiating crew tonight. Jeff Tambroni unhappy with the explanation he's getting from the officiating crew. Right, there was the crowd here. Fresh 60 seconds for Princeton. I think that's what they're unhappy about. Slusher working on a shorty, trying to take advantage. Couldn't, though. We go back up top with Mackesy. Stanit sets him a pick. Now he gets it back. 
shot. Save made by Frassion. Good save by the sophomore Big Ten Specialist of the Year, Jack Frassion, staring down some heat from Alex Vardaro. Penn State hasn't really been able to get much going on this end of the field, Carl. Just one shot so far to this point, midway through the first quarter. I'd like to see a heavy dose of T.J. Malone behind the cage, operating the offense. This is an offense that loves to pick. These offenses, Connor, actually are very similar. Flag down. Princeton's going to get a penalty against him as Morin tried to make him pay before we got the whistle. Now we'll get the call. Marquez White with hold. He'll sit for 30 seconds. Take a look at this right here. Get him for a hold. This is an extra man unit that the ball spins at hyper speed. It's been a specialty of Jeff Tambroni's forever. I mean, he always has strong man up units. Inside shoot, off the pipe again. That's at least the third pipe we've seen. Today, player gets dumped, no call. Penn State with possession. Malone. Gets the extra pass to Winkoff. There's Winkoff up top. Now full strength. Malone forces it inside, and Penn State is able to get on the board. Ethan Long finds the back of the net. TJ can deal, Cotter. Seven and white. Good passers find seams. Great passers find seams through a skip in a through pass. Shades of Grant Ament. The Penn State Turnbull Award winner. Most assists in NCAA history in 2019. That offense was explosive. And Grant was masterful with the through pass. If Meekin wins it to himself, Slusher ups not to go with early offense. Instead, backs it out, waits for reinforcements. TJ Malone was a freshman on that team with Ament and Mac O'Keefe. He got playing time on that offense that was absolutely loaded. Dylan Folds on that team. Oh, and now he's healthy. He was nicked up the last year and a half. You finally have a healthy Malone, and what does he do? Big Ten Offensive Player of the Year. Slusher. Frassiot saw it all the way. It's off to a good start. That's four saves. State, nice job on the clear. That trainer brought it across. He'll wait for teammates. Jake Moore and the like checking in. Trainer's getting the pole, 22 and white, because he's athletic and can get down the alley and shoot on the run. Cost now trying to take advantage of the fact that he doesn't have the pole. Tough angle shot. Sends it wide, but it'll stay with Penn State. Jack Trainer will put it into play. He's got good speed too. Around the crease, top side. Nothing doing. Defended well. Ben Finley, and the team captains on this Princeton team on him. Roll back. We get it. Now we'll get a call in the crease. Joe Junker kiss, trying to get the ball across the midfield line, finds a teammate. I mentioned earlier, both of these offense have some similarities. They love the pick game. They also do a wonderful job at getting their offensive players to the middle of the field. They'll manipulate ball movement to get better angled shots. 
Slusher up top. That shot whistled by by Sean Cameron. Still plenty of time, 44 seconds to shoot as McAsee will put it in play. McAsee beats his man. They'll have a flag. No, no signal yet on the goal. Officials talk about it in the crease. Goal is good. They'll wave the push off and count the goal, Kark. I think this is the right call, but we're going to want to see the replay. McAsee is so smooth. He's going against a big, strong, muscular guy. And Jack Posey pushes him, and you see the half circle, the goal mouth. It appears he gets the shot off. The ball crosses the plane, and he doesn't land in the goal mouth. The goal is good, but when you're playing a really physical defender, you don't want to get into his body. Do you see that quick underneath move by Coulter McAsee? That is just what the doctor orders when you're playing against a heavy thumper like Jack Posey. McMeekin battling with Mullins. Penn State comes out of there with it. Sickler gets it back. He can shoot. Gio makes the save. Sickler's a former offensive midfielder, converted the D midi, so he's got skills. And that's what Penn State has with Aldridge and Sickler, two converted offensive middies who have embraced the short stick defensive midfield position, and it's changed the complexity of this team. Malone gets to the middle of the field. Back outside to Mac Hobbs, second midfield unit on. Ethan Long's got his defender hung up, looking for a cutter. Malone's right in front of the crease. Long inside, tried to force the pass, couldn't make it work, but it stays with Penn State. They like Long behind the cage. He's probably their best passing midfielder. 20 and white. Link off. 15 to shoot. No angle, has to take it back, goal line extended. Tried to force a pass inside, it's picked off. Here comes Finley. Good look, finds Bo Patterson. One of the top team meetings in the Ivy League. First time we've mentioned number 23 in black tonight. Does look like he wants to come off. Pass it up to McAsee. Smart move by Pedersen. And McAsee, you saw the last time he went to the rack on Posey. Playing in space, not letting Posey get into his body. McAsee shoots, Fassion goes down and makes the save. Still, though, McAsee gets it back. Dangerous moment here, and he scores. How did he get the ball back? He's got a nose for the ball. And a bigger nose for payday. Right there, beautiful shot location. McAsee does not give up on the play. The ride. The recovery and the score on a righty goalie. Look at the placement, too. He's so smooth. The great goal scorers sometimes make it look easy. Totally under control. Almost like he's down a speed, right? Yeah. Like he's so calm. You saw where he stands on the overall lists. For Princeton goal scores, big time names on that list. He's deservedly so a part of it. Princeton gets the ball in the faceoff as well after the violation. That's Tommy Barnes, 21 with the ball in his cross. Akasi, beautiful skip pass. The extra plus one doesn't work out for him, though. Ball on the carpet. Both teams 5-4. It'll be Penn State's ball. The biggest thing with Coulter McAsee, as he has a first quarter hat trick, is last year he played off of Chris Brown. This year, with all the injuries, the huge X on his back. I'm going to be quite honest with you. I didn't know if he could be a number one attackman because of his style and the way that he played last year. He has answered the bell and then some. Exceeded all expectations and is a proven 
elite attackman nationally. The numbers speak for themselves, but the style, the fluidity in his game is what jumps the most. Costin. Over to the near side of Jack Trainer. Costin looking to beat a shorty. Now the slide comes, and it works out perfectly for Princeton. That's not the offense you want when you're down 4-1, and your offense isn't in a groove. Give it to your quarterback. Give it to TJ Malone. Give it to an established senior guy who can run the offense, or Jack Trainer, who's been around forever. Those are the guys that need to touch the ball and run your offense. Fit turnover this game for Penn State. That's been a story and why they're down three goals early. Final minute of this first quarter. Cameron DeMacasy goal line extended. Now up top to the big fella. Stan it can't handle it though. He turns it over. Aldrich. Over to Winkoff. Whistle on the play. Penn State wants to call timeout. Coach Tambroni wants to talk things over. Shot clock off, 24 seconds remaining. That's a tough turnover for Princeton because they had the shot clock in their favor. It's almost matching the game clock could have exhausted any opportunity for the home team to get another chance offensively at home, get the crowd back in it as you enter the second quarter. That's not the turnover you want if you're Princeton and Matt Madelon. NCAA men's lacrosse coverage continues next weekend with the quarterfinals. Action begins Saturday, May 20th at noon on ESPNU. For more information on the 2023 men's lacrosse championship, visit NCAA.com, your home for all 90 NCAA championships. Good crowd here tonight. We had a beautiful day here in Happy Valley, filling up Panzer Stadium. What a gorgeous setting this is, too, with the mountains in the backdrop. Beaver Stadium right along the way. Beautiful. Want to say Happy Mother's Day as well to all the beautiful moms, all the lacrosse moms as well, put so much time and energy into the journey of these young men that are playing in the NCAA tournament. I think back to my days playing and my beautiful mom, Diane, who left us way too early, nine years ago. She was the best lacrosse mom in the world. Had no clue about the sport, the rules. All she cared after the game was, where are we eating dinner? <laughs> Where's the tailgate? If Weren't you tried you to talk X's and O's with her, she'd tell you to get lost. Where, wasn't she cooking most of the time? I mean, wasn't my that dad a part was. of it? Oh, my dad, dad would was, big, yeah. bring big trays of ziti and <laughs> chicken parm. To the game. Most kids have, you know, orange slices and Sprite at a game. <laughs> Your games that you had ziti and pasta with gravy. Ravioli, notice I said gravy and not sauce. It's the best, but you think about what these parents go through, right? We travel and we call these games and the anxiety of all the moms oh. watching their boys play in these tournament games, especially when and these it, games it never are coming ends. down to the wire. By the way, it too. never ends. We saw never Kevin ends. Warren and his parents oh. and his mom was at the game yesterday yes. for Georgetown. She was losing her mind. <laughs> Final seconds of this first quarter. Penn State trying to dig into that deficit. Trainer gets hammered. Knocked off his line. Finley puts it to him. Malone, though, can't get it off. Can't get the shot off. Horn's going to sound to end the first quarter. It's a fruitful quarter of play for the Ivy League champs. Princeton on the road, and their fans letting the players hear it. Four to one with the lead after one. Fans enjoying a great game of lacrosse here at Happy Valley. The fans clad in orange and black enjoying it a little bit more. Four to one after one, Tigers with the lead.
Penn State had a heck of a team in 2019, Clark. We watched them march through the tournament, putting on putting up football scores. One of the best offenses I've ever seen. Guys like Jack Kelly and Dylan Foltz, and don't forget about the quarterback Grant Amen, who was just one of the best passers in college lacrosse history. And they had the shooter, the stretch shooter, in Mac O'Keefe. When he would stroke it lefty, it's a thing of beauty. Their championship run fell short, though, against Yale in the semifinals when Yale just came out, blitzed them in the first half, and the comeback just wasn't enough. That was the best team in Penn State history in 2019, but this team has a chance to go even further. They've got a chance to do some real damage, but they got to figure a way to get, get some points on the board here against Princeton, just the one solitary goal in the first quarter. This Princeton team is just embodied the word team, right? Being held together with duct tape. Six starters out for the season. Right, I mean, you think about the names, too. Sam English, Christian Ronda, Braden Saris, Luke Anderson, Tyler Sandoval, the face-off man at the start Nuts. of the year. And McMeekin's done a great job coming in to take draws. He just won that last one. So possession to Princeton to start this second quarter. Stan at 6-4, number 29 in black. Bounce shot, Frassion sees it, makes the stop. Loose ball in front of the crease, though. See how Frassion got tall on that high bouncer? That was a tremendous body save. Looked easy, but it wasn't. Pause brings it in, thought we might get a pole goal opportunity. Wasn't handled very well that time. Kevin Parnham had a shot. It's gonna go the other way. Wow, it looked like Penn State was closer to the ball when it went out of bounds, but I think the Penn State player trainer might have been out of bounds, actually, out of the field of play. Note for Princeton Ringhofer, number 51, Jack Ringhofer, oftentimes a midfielder. Playing attack today. Thought his speed and quickness might come in handy. Didn't need him on that play, though. John Dunphy, we talked about him earlier. Fantastic hockey player growing up, kind of has that sense. Quick decision making. He reminds you a little bit of Coulter Mackesy, too. Two-handed cradle lefty guy that can get to the middle of the field. What's the common denominator with both? Mackesy is an elite squash player, was ranked in the top five nationally in high school. Dumphy, the hockey player, what do they have in common? The wrists. Silky hands, great wrists. Five to one, Princeton on top. Dumphy explaining how he did it. When you watch this offense, Jim Mitchell, the offensive coordinator, I think he's masterful at how he gets matchups to shoot from the middle of the field. And when you shoot from the middle of the field, you're shooting at an ocean, basically, compared to these low angle shots when you're dodging down the alleys with, with nothing to look at. And he does that through a pick game. And he also offsets offensively where there's some overload so offensive players are playing in a lot of space. Moving pick, we're gonna go the other way. Penn State needs it. They're in a 10 plus minute scoring drought. And possession is severely tilted towards the other side of the field in this first half. Seven's gonna have to take over in white, isn't he, Cart? He is, but Colin Molshine has proven to be a heck of a defender. But what I like about this Princeton defense, they're not that matchup oriented. They don't really get crazy if they're not having the, the matchups. Like if it's not Molshan on TJ Malone, they're not panicking. Moore now inverts to X, gets rid of it. Here's Trainer. Jump pass over to Moore and can't get anything going though. Gonna be an over and back. Seventh turnover for Penn State. Coach Tambrody and his staff 
Got to be in a great deal of concern right now in the fact that they just haven't gotten any rhythm offensively at all in this game. And they're potentially dealing with a red-hot offensive player in Coulter Mackesy who has a hat trick already. And when you watch Mackesy, he plays off of confidence. We've seen him this year score eight goals against Yale, eight goals against Harvard. When he gets cooking, he gets confident, and he thinks he's invincible. Dunphy, this second midfield line, getting a lot of minutes for Princeton. Slusher. Goal line extended, trying to use a pick. Too tough an angle that time, but Slusher looked like he might have been open. He, Stevens opts not to get it to him. Mackesy now. See Dunphy trying to set him a pick. Mackesy works around it. Dunphy spins back to the middle of the field. Nothing doing. Slusher. Under 20 to shoot. Shoots, doesn't get through. Gets it back. Now he goes to the other side. It still doesn't get through. Fresh 60-second clock, though. Princeton trying to take advantage of a little disorganization, and they do. And who else? Mackesy, his fourth of the night. What I tell you, Cotter, Coulter is cooking. Certain players just get into a zone. The game becomes a blur. I talked to him about this earlier in the season what it's like to be in a zone. He lets his instincts take over, and a natural goal scorer looks like he's losing his angle, but you've seen the ability with low angle shots. He had one against Syracuse earlier in the season, was behind the cage, still cashed in. What he does is he stretches his arms out. He takes his stick away from the body at the last second, keeps it tight for the stick protection, but when he shoots, his wingspan increases, and he hits the back of the net. Coulter Mackesy is a high-volume shooter, and when he's feeling it, watch out. And Jack Frassion just a split second too late in closing the door on the near side pipe. And Mackesy, we said it yesterday a couple of times in that crazy Georgetown Yale game, that's a goal scorer's goal. He finds a way to beat the goaltender every which way you can imagine. And that's four on the night so far. And we've got a long way to go here, partner. Sam Sweeney is on Mackesy there temporarily. Ball deflected out of bounds. It'll stay with Princeton. Confident young man, 91, in black. As I mentioned, he was a top five squash player in the country when he was in high school. Shot whistled wide by Verdaro. His teammate, Christian Rondo, was a squash player as well. They battle. Mackesy told me one time, spotted him 10 points. It only takes 11 to win in squash. Mackesy won 11-10. Rondo was very happy with you telling that story. <laughs> most of the kids these days are playing pickleball. I shouldn't say kids. Most of the old dudes like us are playing pickleball, paddleball. Matt Ward's Brilliant paddle ball player. Squash, not so much anymore. Six to shoot. Slusher's got to make something happen. Not that side. He goes to the other side. Slusher's emergency is a necessity with all the injuries. You don't have to go too far back to know what he's capable of. 40-plus goal scorer in 2022 when Princeton went to championship weekend. He only had nine goals going into the Ivy Championship a week ago, but last week I saw the confidence, I saw the assertiveness, and the ability to answer the bell. And he's got a shorty on him quite a bit. And he probably, in the back of his mind, thinks, okay, you're going to short stick me? You're not going to put a long pole on me. That's disrespect. I'm going to the rack. Part of that crew from the Oregon Trail made its way East Stevens. Picks up a big ground ball in the middle of the field. Here comes Princeton again.
I did not see this coming. Did you? Seven to one. Penn State hasn't lost at home this year. No, they're undefeated. This is kind of death by a thousand cuts, don't you think, Clark? It's like a slow. It's not like a like a blitz where they score four or five goals quickly. It's just a slow bleed here on this side of the field for the entire game. Shot too high for Mackesy. That's precisely correct. And what makes it even more demoralizing for Penn State's defense is there's a lot of unassisted goals here. So they're going after Penn State's defense. Every single goal is unassisted. And that's incredible. That's like saying our guys are better than yours on this side of the field. Tigers content to run the shot clock down a little bit here. Barnes now back up top to Cameron. Ten to shoot. Skip pass, tried to force that one into Barnes. Didn't work. Nittany Lions are in desperate need of a goal here. Gotta stem the tide. The trainer brothers 22 gets it over to Malone. Malone and Molshine. Molshine trying to stay with him. Malone, good look, and Long buries it. The speed of the senior TJ Malone is elite. The vision is spectacular. The instincts are superb. The Big Ten Offensive Player of the Year isn't going away. He spot feeds teammate Ethan Long. Sweeney bounces right back up and scores! Magnificent! PLL does that better than anybody in the business. Oof. Making those promos, getting you fired up for the season June 3rd on ABC. And of course, every game all summer long can be seen streaming live on ESPN. Plus, total domination from Princeton so far tonight. It's been incredible what they've done offensively, too, in this not typical Princeton offense. They're number two in the nation in assists per game. All seven of their goals tonight are unassisted. Yeah, and McMeekin has owned the faceoff dot. Eight of 11 so far tonight.
Tigers more than content to get into 6 v 6 run some clock and then score at the end of the shot clock. It's been the formula all game long. McAsee now near side of Ardaro. 19 in black. Senior from Woodmere, New York on this number one midfield line for the Tigers. McAsee now increases his angle, gets up field. Cameron, still 25 to shoot. Tigers are being patient. Rodaro now back over to McAsee. Now he gets it behind a slusher. Cameron now has to make something happen with 10. Rodaro, he looked like he wanted to shoot, but he lost the ball. Coming out of there with it is Kevin Parnum. Parnum on his horse. This might help Penn State if they can get something early. They take the shot and score! And it's Sickler! That's the loudest we've heard this crowd at Panzer Stadium all night. The former offensive midi once again shows he can shoot the ball. And that's just it. The number one seed in the tournament is Duke. They have some converted offensive middies that have allowed them to hit in transition. When you speak to Jeff Tambroni, he said it's a difference maker for this team. Transition goals from guys like Sickler, who were recruited as offensive midfielders, that can stretch a defense, and when they bring it across the midline, you better respect them, or... That is gonna happen. Sickler scores. Kevin Parnum all props to 55 in white as well. Picking up that ground ball, getting it into possession. McMeekin, he'll shoot. Frassian, no issues. Now quickly on the outlet. Malone, look at Malone coming to get the ball. No offside either for Penn State. Trainer. Here's Malone. He scores! Pansamonian. They love their Nittany Lions. TJ Malone is having himself a half. He's had two incredible passes. He's riding all over the place. And he knows this will be the last time he plays on this turf. You gotta go for broke in the shot location on Princeton Gianfrancaro, who's a righty. The last two shots perfectly placed to the offside lower corner. Sickler, then Malone. Three goals in less than two minutes has Penn State believing once again. Gotta find some type of solution though at that faceoff dot. McMeekin is dominating both Mullins and Bond. Hudson Bond took the draw on that last time, Clark, and McMeekin won it easily to himself. Princeton's won 10. Penn State just three. Because they can do this, they can get the ball back and take the air out of it. Once again, work that shot clock down. He's won eight straight draws, McMeekin has. 10 total. It's hard to make a run, isn't it? Now they're going to slow things down. You got Ringhofer behind the cage. Now up top to Verdaro. Ringhofer now comes back in front of the crease. Still 22 to shoot. Cameron will shoot wide. Backing it up beautifully, though, is Mackesy. Inside, Verdaro. Bounce shot goes wide. Stays with Princeton. 10 to shoot. Rodaro. Defense wraps him. Didn't get a call. They will get one here, though, but he scores anyways. What an effort. Alex Rodaro. Came into this game all Ivy Clark. He was all world on that play. He's so skilled and so two-handed, and he's playing with a heavy heart. He had to join the team late as his grandmother passed away. He was on Long Island. Attending the services. 
You see the hold there. To switch hands while all that pressure is applied just tells you his balance, strength, and overall skill. These guys are dealing with so much, too. Princeton's in the middle of their finals. I was talking to some players. These guys are taking finals. Some tonight. Yes. Some online On tonight trip. after it's the crazy. game. <laughs> For Dara, one of three Princeton midfielders with a 2020 season. You know who the others are? Schreiber and Courier. Uh, that's pretty good company. That's ridiculous. And he just showed why he can include himself in that company on that play. You could argue those are the two best midfielders in the world, right? Different players. Schreiber wins the PLL Midfielder of the Year almost every year. Zach Courier is, for my money, the most versatile midfielder maybe I've ever seen. Malone gets a great look. That's the third time tonight. Seven has found 20 on the doorstep, and they've converted. Penn State's on to something here with T.J. Malone. All three of his assists are towards the top of the restraining box. He's able to use his speed, get the defense to stare at him, and he finds these bottom corners across his body. That's the second pass to Ethan Long. T.J. Malone is showing some versatility for the next level in the PLL, too, because Andy Towers, the coach of the chaos, picked up Malone. And he's got some options with this guy because he can play up top, he can play behind. He's a scorer, he's a passer. He's got the full game, Cotter. Long has been finding himself, putting himself in the right spots tonight also as we look at this battle. Mullins has said, I've had enough. I'm not going down without a fight, and this is a big time fight at the center of this field. You don't see this very often anymore, Kark. Who's gonna win the battle for the ground ball? It's gotta be a loose ball push. No call. Penn State, will we get a shot to score here? No, Geo denies him. Wow, Aldridge had a great look there too. That would have blown the roof off this place if it had one place is popping only fitting if you've watched first round lacrosse this weekend we knew the sunday night late game would not disappoint put a bow on the weekend just the third save of the night for jennifer carl but boy was it a big one cameron even those penn state shorties paul they know that these Tigers want to get to the middle of the field. Shading him that way. Cameron's going to get a good look here. Bounces it to Frassion. Here comes Aldridge again. This time he opts to get it to Malone. Where's 20? I mean, it has been a combo. Winkoff coming up field. Final two minutes of this first half. Moments ago was looking like a Princeton blowout all the way. Penn State is fighting back on their home turf. Skip past the trainer across the way. He'll shoot, scores! Listen to this crowd! Trainer is an athlete. He's strong, he's explosive, he's very right-handed. But the ability to shoot across his body to that far pipe. They're getting to Geo, Cotter. Gene Fercaro's had one of the best five-week stretches we've seen in the nation, but on the road, He's going to have to answer the bell in this game for Princeton to live to fight another day in advance to the quarters. Closest we've been since the 440 mark of the first quarter. Ginder now takes the draw for Princeton. And Kobe Ginder continues the winning ways for the Tigers at the dot. If you're Penn State defensively, you have to start 
supporting matchups. All eight goals for Princeton are unassisted. You have to force them into feeding spots. The issue is this is a unit offensively that's accustomed to sharing the ball. But tonight, you have to slide. Behind a Ringhofer, now up top, Slusher. He'll look to dodge from the wing. Little two-man game with Stevens, goes around the other way. Mackesy shoots and scores! Can he do it in a variety of ways or what? He's got a five spot. Princeton gets their first assisted goal with a step down hammer to the corner. Coulter Mackesy is feeling it. Give him the rock, give it to him often because he is finding the back of the net. And if you are Penn State, you have to get out, go on the hands of 91, and do anything you can to stop him from shooting because he is in a zone. Exactly a minute left in this first half. McMeekin and Mullins battling. Of course, it's Stevens who picks up the ground ball, makes a move. Pump return clear himself. He can shoot if he chooses. Got the shorty on him. Instead, now he waits. Gets it behind the cage. Shot clock irrelevant. You just mentioned Steven's name. He's the closest thing that we've seen to Zach Courier. He's played man down. How did he, did he look like him in the middle off. of the field right yeah. there? I mean, exactly like him. 9-6, we get the timeout. Coach Madelon wants to talk about it one final time. Use it or lose it with that timeout, so he uses it with 33.8 remaining. You look at the brackets once again. This is the final game of eight this weekend and they have been extraordinarily entertaining card incredible how about delaware taking duke to the final minutes delaware had some high-end talent with owen grant drafted number two in the pll to the redwoods ty kurtz second rounder for the chaos don't forget tonight the action heads to Edmonton for game six of the Western Conference semifinals between the Golden Knights and the Oilers. Vegas up three games to two. Coverage begins at 10 Eastern, 7 Pacific on ESPN, and as always, streaming on the app. Knows a huge hockey fan, Matt Madelon. Oh, Matt Madelon's a big hockey oh, fan? Love, oh, loves yeah. Hockey. Loves hockey. Rangers fan? Yeah. Yeah, I think he's a Rangers fan. Yes. As am I. What are you? Uh, Vancouver Canucks. How are you a Canucks fan? Well, I was a Colorado Rockies fan when they were originally in Colorado with yes. Lanny McDonald and Rob Ramage and Chico Resch. You lived there. Yeah, and then they moved to New Jersey, and my heart was broken. <laughs> so I picked the worst team in the Western Conference to, to root for after that, and it was the Canucks. Okay, it's a story. That's a story tonight right there. That is the story. Five goals, five of the nine goals. He scored them in a variety of different ways. And he, that goal right there was a big part of stemming this Nittany Lion tie that had started to build up here at the end of this first half. You know, Mackesy's development as a player over the last 365 days has been incredible. A finisher, a wing shooter, now an explosive Dodger who is just testing this Penn State defense. Possession after possession with five goals. Here he is again, now up top to Cameron. He'll fire from that spot again, doesn't get through, hits a Penn State defender. 10 seconds left in this first half. Picked up by the Nittany Lions. Chucked out of bounds, that'll be Princeton ball with four seconds left. Do the Tigers have enough time to get anything here offensively? Coach Tambroni wants to talk things over though first just to make sure his defense is in a spot where they don't give up a cheapie. Four seconds is enough time. From that angle, you can have a 30-yard feed. I'll tell you who I'd put inside, Jake Stevens. He catches everything. The Canadian who's exceptional at box lacrosse as well. You look at his hands and one of the best man up players in the country, when they put him inside, he's something else. So there's an opportunity for Princeton here with four seconds left. Jeff Tambroni knows, so he wants to counter, pack it in inside. 
If we go to the half at 9 6 here, Clark, I think if you're Jeff Tamboni, you have to feel pretty good about the fact that you're getting your doors blown off just moments ago, and this team really fought back, and now they're showing signs of life. I would agree with you. I thought this game was kind of getting away from Penn State. Credit that man right there who made a couple of adjustments, but also Jack Frassian, I thought, has made some, some big stops in moments where a save had to be made. Frassian has nine in the first half. Gio Fricaro doesn't have very many at all when you think about it. He's got three saves in this. He hasn't been tested that often, and when he has, he hasn't come up big lately. Penn State had a couple spectacular shots to the lower offside corner. But when you only have three saves and you feel the fans, the pressure could mount for this young goalie. Four seconds thrown toward the net, hoping for maybe a rebound, didn't get it. And that horn sounds to end the first half. Coulter Mackesy, the star for Princeton, as the Tigers, the Ivy champs, up 9-6 as we head to the break. Clark and I will have first round highlights of all the action that we have seen, and there has been a lot of it, folks, this weekend, and further analysis in the first half. Mackesy's got five on the night. Tamperoni frustrated early. His team didn't give up, though, fighting until the end, long with the hat trick. He's been feed, fed by TJ Malone all night long. Denny Lyons coming back down three. Clark and Cotter here at the half, 9-6, to six, our score. Princeton on top of Penn State. Eighth and final game of our first round action, the NCAA lacrosse tournament. Man, we have had some great games. Let's go earlier today. Hopkins and Bryant. 3-3 three, three game earlier than Russell Melendez and Jacob Angelos. Those two guys started taking over. Hopkins went on a 15-0 run. Melendez had nine points, broke a postseason scoring total in Johns Hopkins lacrosse That's history. That bizarre. is nuts when yeah. you think about it with nine points. But I just thought the variety in which they scored. Angelus was the conductor dishing Melendez 
was spectacular finishing. And John Crawley, the offensive coordinator, is finding ways to make this team really unpredictable. Right. There's Russell with some shake. Oh, so air pass. Now, how about a shot? Yeah, that's Mazzone. The grad transfer from Georgetown has been a huge addition for the Blue Jays and head coach Peter Milliman. Who's increased his wins the last three years. They now have 12 on the season. A little BTB by Russell. Hopkins dispatches of Ryan. You see the 3 3 after one, then nine goals in the second quarter alone for Hopkins to put that game away at the half. And they cruise. Michigan and Cornell. This was anything but a cruise for either of these teams. We thought it would be great, and it was. Look at Jake Manomi behind the back. This was an incredible game. Up in Ithaca, Cornell goes to the national championship a year ago. They have CJ Kirst, one of the Tuarton frontrunners, who gobbles up that rebound. Body blow after body blow, and Peter Thompson. The Ann Arbor native in the Georgetown grad transfer has a monster goal, but Cascadin, the freshman Fogo, ties it up. And Mikey Bain, no one had more goals in the Big Ten than Mr. Underrated himself. Billy Coyle keeps Cornell close. But Peter Thompson, you said his name earlier, he really came to play here late in this game. Look at that beautiful feed, and then the deep low, and he beats Erlen High. You grow up in Ann Arbor, the big block M. What a dream. Part of your life. That what is epic. Congratulations. Winner. I mean, that, Michigan continues to roll. How many people over the last couple of weeks have said to you, I think Michigan, I think the luck is going to run out. I think the magic is eventually going to run out. It is not running out. They keep winning and keep advancing. That's why we call it May Madness. Delaware and Duke. John Donowski, Paul, Ben DeLuca, rather, with a hug and handshake before the game. Ty Kurtz, this guy could score anywhere, anytime. Three goals in the first half. He'll play for the PLL Chaos. This is a talented team. But Garrett Ledman, showing you some force and some range. We were watching this game prior to our game, and Delaware just wouldn't let up. Same guys that did it last year. You saw Ty Kurtz, J.P. Ward for Delaware. Names that have become household names. But Brendan O'Neill, that's a household name. Dyson Williams, I thought Andrew McAdory willed his team in the third quarter. He had three goals right after the half. You saw the emotion. Keeping it close, though. Owen Grant finds Kurtz for the goal. Watch this play by O'Neal. One-handed grab, and look how quickly he gets into shooting mode. 6-3, skill, knack for the cage. We talked about short stick D-minis in our game. Finding the back of the net, finding transition. The two-way guys were stars. Charlie O'Connor with the goal there for Duke. They were able to outlast Delaware and the number one seed in this tournament advances. We'll look back to Saturday's games. Yeah, there are a couple of doozies on Saturday as well when we come back.
We're at halftime here at Penn State. We are wrapping up what has been a great weekend of first round action in the NCAA lacrosse tournament. Clark, we had two phenomenal games yesterday. Let's start with the nightcap, Army and Maryland. And Army showed right from the start that they belong. Ryan Spacito is gonna score, then John Monero scores. Army seven to two. They were getting to the rack, sharing the ball. And the Black Knights, from a speeds perspective, we're clicking on all cylinders, but Eric Spanos and the defending champs, you knew they weren't going to go away. He ties it up at seven. In the third quarter, the best defensive player on the field became an offensive player. Big Ten Defender of the Year, Brett Makar from my hometown. Yorktown, New York, ties it up at 11, but Army built to respond. And how about this shot by Jacob Moore? Maybe the fastest shooter in college lacrosse. Wow. And then with 122 remaining, Army's up one. Finn McCullough takes the shot, goes up Ryan Rupel's stick, which means a fresh 60, but Gunnar Fellows opts to shoot and score. That last minute for the Black Knights was dicey as Maryland had multiple opportunities to tie it up, but Joe Alberici and crew, they advance. Yale Georgetown was a barn burner. You and I did this game from our nation's capital. It was Thomas Bragg early for Yale. They went on a run in the first half, and then Georgetown, though, said, we got to make a run of our own. Let's turn to number two. Tucker Dordovic was incredible. The grad transfer from Syracuse, six goals and one assist from all over the offensive set. Grad transfer, Nicky Solomon, he had a five spot. The offensive explosion and the answers from both teams, incredible. You can see the scoreboard on the bottom. It's just a one-goal game pretty much throughout. Hackler had a twister. Minicus comes back from behind the cage. Brandau then ties the game at 17 for Yale. Then to your point, Solomon. He has been phenomenal all game long. Minicus from behind the cage. He scores. Here's the one from Solomon that gave a two-point cushion. Yeah, I thought Solomon's play and how patient he was finding offense was incredible. The Hoyas advance after a disappointing end to the season in 2022 when they were bounced by Delaware on that same field. They're headed to the quarterfinals. Take a look at the lower bracket because of Hopkins beating Bryant earlier on today. It's all filled out. Notre Dame and Hopkins next Sunday in Annapolis, Georgetown and Virginia in Albany on Saturday. You look at the top performers, or some of them from the day that was on Saturday. We mentioned Gunner Fellows for Army and Tucker Dordovic for Georgetown. How about Jake Taylor? A long awaited for offensive explosion for the kid from Notre Dame coming back from injury. Just what the doctor ordered. He had less than 20 goals heading into the contest, and he took some pressure yesterday off the Kavanaugh's. Pat and Chris playing on the wings. Taylor on the inside. Don't forget about Peyton Cormier, maybe the most underrated finisher in college lacrosse. Second half still to come from Happy Valley.
gorgeous night in Happy Valley. A lot, a lot prettier than last night when the fog almost led to our demise, Kark. 9-6 Princeton on top. Chris Cotter and Paul Carcaterra. Coulter Mackesy was unbelievable in that first half. Princeton got a big lead, then Penn State kind of edged back closer. You're witnessing a player that's just on a completely different level in Coulter Mackesy. Five goals in the first half, and he's done it a variety of ways. His dodging has been elite. He's calling out the Penn State defenders on an island. And he's been incredible in terms of the way that he's finding pay dirt. Eventually, Penn State decides to go into a zone in the second quarter because the first eight goals from Princeton were unassisted. Well, here's the ninth, and it's Mackesy against the zone. It don't matter. Five goals, the Princeton single game record for a postseason game is six, so we'll keep an eye on that. Shots uh, in the first half leaning toward Princeton, just about everything leaning toward Princeton. The big one also is faceoffs. One in 12 of 17 draws, mostly Andrew McMeekin. A little bit of Kobe Ginder in there as well, and we'll go right to the faceoff, Dot. This is an area that Chase Mullins, Hudson Bond, both got a battle for Penn State. You don't have to totally flip that stat in the second half, but you got to get closer to 50-50, and McMeekin wins it easily. I think Matt Madelon and staff, too, are doing a nice job of using McMeekin, a little dose of Kobe Kinder. Just giving him a little break here and there. They know they're going to need McMeekin in the fourth quarter of this game, keeping him as fresh as they possibly can. There's Mackesy, 91 in black. Over to the big fella, Stanit, 29. That's Cameron. Dodaro, goal line extended. Mackesy, Princeton showing that patience. Feeds it inside. Slusher, bouncer. Penn State on that first Princeton possession jumps back into the zone. We saw Mackesy as a zone buster. Who else are the outside shooters? Well, Alex Vardaro's one of them. Cameron's another, so they do have the guys. I expect a little bit of a chess match now. Jim Mitchell will, will counter with some offensive zone. Trainer got a good look, but the ball came out of his cross just before he was able to fire. Pedersen loses his footing right at midfield in all kinds of trouble. Trying to battle his way through it, can't. Loses it on the ground. Malone. Got it to Winkoff. Didn't have a good look, though, so he slows it up. And Jack Trainer now will get it to Jack Moore. Jake Moore, rather, coming in. Full head of steam. Had a pick from Malone. Long. Can't get the shot off. That one looked like it got a piece of Geo. Maybe even a piece of the pipe. Yeah, now it did. We'll get a whistle. Wanted to make sure they reset the shot clock to 60. Yeah, Gio made that stop. <laughs> Officials talk it over. But I think you're right, Clark. They'll reset that shot clock. Gio was flopping on that one. Doing everything he can to get something in front of that ball, and he did a good job making the save. Fresh 60, so. He's been so good ever since he became the starter for Princeton. Number two nationally in save percentage. Oh, they're not resetting. And you can hear Coach Madelon. He can't believe it. That's going to be the call, though. We're not Madelon. Tamaroni couldn't believe it. Yeah, the refs must have said it hit a defender and not Geo. Yeah. Still plenty of time, though, for Penn State. Definitely hit the pipe. Yeah. <laughs> Winkoff shot. Wants to put a dent in the pipe. That's what he's known for. 48 and White, the grad transfer from Binghamton, has just established himself as a big time shooter. Now he's on the extra man for like the last four to five games. You've got to get him in shooting spots. 
Big hit knocks him off his feet, though. Wow, Billings really laid it into him. Well, now we're going to get a call for a push in the back. A push in the back, but he had the ball. If you're going to call that, it's with possession. It should be right. 30 seconds. Right, and it's a late call with the push in the back, too. Take a look at it here. There's the push. You could argue it's a push in the back. If it's a push in the back, though, he has the ball when yeah. it's pushed. Should, should be, be 30, 30 seconds. seconds. Not. Geo makes that save, steers it aside. Now the race of the ball on the sideline. Won by Penn State. Ethan Long's having himself a heck of a game. Hustle play there to keep possession for the Nittany Lions. And a fresh 60 to shoot. This is a long defensive possession for both Patterson and Princeton. But he may have forced the turnover here. Stays with Penn State. Smart play to get it out of traffic by Trainer. Knew this, he had teammates behind him. Yeah, this is a long possession right now to be playing defense. Long shoots. Gio makes the save. Couple of saves on that possession. Now six for the game. Throws it away. White throws it away. And I say that, Connor, because look who we see by the midfield. That's Patterson. We've seen him back and forth now multiple times. He's going to sub because he's gassed. But this Princeton defense, inability to clear. Tigers have already turned the ball over three times in this quarter. Long puts the far pipe. That shot had a lot of pace on it. Got by Gio, but the goalie's best friend, that far pipe, saved him. That shot by Long right on the bottom corner. Fourth post of the night. Yeah. Now Mackesy just settling things down a little bit for the Tigers after that long possession on the other end. Wants to give his defense a rest. Slusher behind the cage. Defenders hung up. Back up top to Mackesy. Stand it. There's Verdaro. Extra pass, jump shot. Frassion, no chance to beat him on that one. The call to go to zone was the right one. Princeton just doesn't seem like they're in that same groove when Penn State was playing man and they were owning them with the one-on-one -on -one dodging matchups. What I'll be looking for for Princeton, future possessions, they're moving the ball, but you gotta get a skip pass in there. Costin coming out of the box. Beats the shorty. Now help's got to come, and it does. Flag down. Costin trying to get a shot off before we get the call. Delayed call against Princeton. I think this is going to be a slash. Shot inside. Geo makes the save. Penn State, though, retains possession, so they'll get a fresh 60, and we're still awaiting the call. Winkoff. Don't have to force anything offensively here if you're Penn State at all. Make Princeton run on the defensive end, right, Kark? But this is the matchup you want to hold because TJ Malone has a short stick on him. Malone tries to beat him, does, but shoots it too high. Now, after long last, we get the call from the officials. Number four slash one minute 60 on the shot clock. Paul Weatherington was the man they called this on. Yeah, you could see him the short stick D mid. Yeah, right got him the right face. in the head. I mean, that's a no brainer. So when you watch this 
extra man unit. I watched the tape on them throughout the season. They utilize the crease really well. It's an empty crease right now, but when they get into the crease, not only does the crease man present as a scorer, but also a passer. They'll pass from that crease area quite a bit. Wink off over to Malone. Step down, trainer shoots, slides it to the net. Gio with a really good save. Princeton's in all kinds of trouble, though, in the corner of the field. Out of bounds to Penn State. But that chewed up a lot of that penalty time. Gio is starting to field a little bit, though. He's made some, some crazy leg saves. Winkloff beats him here, though. No amount of crazy from Gio is going to stop that shot. That's called high heat. Five games ago, Winkoff was not on the extra man. Shoot or shoot, and you can't keep a kid like that off the field. Penn State is starting to feel it. Tuesday, it's a big night for the NBA on ESPN. We got NBA countdown tipping up at 7 o'clock Eastern, followed by the 2023 NBA Draft Lottery. Then it's game one of the Western Conference Finals. Lakers and Nuggets at 8.30 Eastern. All those shows also, as you know, stream live on the ESPN app. 7.23 here. Jeff Tambroni, you look at the season from last year to this year, 3-11 and last year. Flip the script to nine and four this year. Big Ten regular season champs. And in need of a big second half here to keep their season going. But it wasn't as big as it was in the first half. I mean, they have closed the gap and they're playing good lacrosse right now. Jeff Tambroni is an incredible lacrosse coach. Ever since his days as a head coach at Cornell, going to championship weekend multiple times. I also think he is an elite developer of attackmen. Whether it's Rob Pinnell, Grant Amen, TJ Malone, he's able to speak their language. And if you're a behind the cage guy, Tambroni gets the best out of you. Rare faceoff violation against Princeton in this game. Tigers on a big time scoring drought over eight minutes. Long comes up top and scores. That's a patented move for him in this game. Four on the night, Cart. He only had 11 coming into the evening. But in May, certain players take their game to another level. Because on the scout, he's probably the sixth most dangerous player. So he's going to get a short stick on him. And it's time to dance. You drop the plant foot at X. You extend with speed and the low angle shooting ability of Ethan Long. We talk about the zone in Coulter Mackesy. Ethan Long's starting to smell it. 
The Tiger lead is down to one. Two goals in 34 seconds for the Nittany Lions. And as the sun set here at Happy Valley, Clark, we have a different game. No room for the weak in the middle of the field. Cooper Kistler comes out of there with it for the Tigers. What an incredible way to cap off this weekend, right? Right. This is, this is. I mean, we had so many great games, a couple of just doozies yesterday, and then today, that Michigan Cornell game was unbelievable. We're, we're poised to have an amazing finish here in Happy Valley. And what looked like it might be a Princeton blowout in the first half, that is certainly not the case anymore. The zone has been Princeton's Achilles heel, though, for the last 10 minutes. Trying to beat it, but Frassion is too good. Look at the effort on the pump return clear as well by Sickler. When you have a goalie like Frassion and you jump into a zone, there's confidence. Big Ten Specialist of the Year, number three nationally in save percentage. You're basically telling your defense, we'll give up the outside shot. We believe in Jack. Don't let him beat us inside. Winkoff with the look. Trainer scores! We're all tied up. Matt Trainer. when you talk to Jeff Tambroni, he said the sophomore midfielder loves the big moment and has been so clutch for him this season. Finding ways when the team needs it. He's a risk taker. He goes for broke, but this time he cashes in. remaining in this third quarter. Princeton has now gone 11 minutes of game time without a goal. Costin. Not a Malone up top. Here's Winkoff. Well, the look inside. Knows he had Jeff Brentfleck. Couldn't connect, though. The question here as the ball enters the Princeton offensive zone, what adjustments do you make offensively? Gets a zone defense. I mentioned earlier the skip pass works. The changing of formations. If you start in a 3-3, maybe you go to a 1-3-2, you go to a 1-4-1. Show different looks to a defense that is packing it in and believes in their goalie. Mackesee. Stan shoots another pipe. And Penn State wins the race to the ball. Don't tell me it's not an advantage to play at home. We're right above this crowd. They are juiced. Panzermonium. It's nuts. The first half, the field was tilted all in Princeton's direction. This half, it has been all Penn State. Malone spins back to his right, he'll shoot. He hit the pipe. 
Penn State retains possession, fresh 60. Five pipes on the night and counting. At least five. Trainer being absolutely harassed by Molshine. You can hear the pads are popping. That shot goes wide. Who wins the race and stays with Penn State? I love how Penn State moves their offensive pieces around. Quarterback TJ Malone has been all over the offensive set today. Here he is with the ball in his cross, now behind. Another one! Ethan Long! He cannot be stopped! Almost doubling his season goal total tonight. Ethan Long at X is a great option because he's probably the best passing midfielder Jeff Tambroni has. Malone hits it to 20. A little shades of Lyle Thompson. The backhand low angle stuff. Long's fifth on the night. And Penn State leads for the first time in the entire game. 2.37 left in this third quarter. And look at Chase Mullins winning face-off draws. When do you start putting a long stick? You have four. When do you put one of those four on Ethan Long, right? Coming into the contest, you didn't even think about it, right? Because you have Matt Trainer, You have all these, these horses at the midfield to contain and to deal with Winkoff. But Ethan Long has dominated the night. Nittany Lions on a 9-2 run to take the lead. Costin, now he comes upfield. Over to Winkoff. Here's Malone. Going to use a Brenner Fleck pick. Shoots on the run and scores! This is crazy. What Jeff Tambroni essentially is doing is he's flipping his offense. He's putting his attack up top, who are accustomed to playing behind. He's putting his midfielders behind on short sticks, taking those defensive middies out of their comfort zone. And he's able to do that because of the flexibility of that guy right there, TJ Malone. His 100th career goal. 29th on the season as he looks to do everything he can to extend his career here in Happy Valley for at least one more weekend. He's an under the radar recruit, a late addition to that class, one of the last pledges in the freshman class of 2019 for Jeff Tambroni. What does Princeton do here, Clark? Final minute and a half of this third quarter. We they asked had him, no answer to this. We asked the question of what, what, was, what was Penn State's answer going to be in the first half? What's Princeton's answer going to be here in the second? Bounces it high. The zone defense of Penn State has completely changed this game. They played exclusively zone for the last two quarters. Mackesee had that outside shot early against the zone defense. After that, they've been scoreless. Princeton has not scored this quarter against this zone defense. Fordaro had to track down that Aaron pass. Skip passes, changing of formations, getting this defense to think. Still dirty to shoot, so plenty of time. Mackenzie now on the short stick. Frassion has been outstanding. And the outlet pass. Look at the dish to Sickler. The idea by Mackesy was actually good. You have to dodge a zone too, Cotter. Because you have to get the defenders in those in-between zones to think. Bring one defender into another zone. And then there's kickback opportunities. Winkoff will fire too high. Had a lot on that shot. 11 seconds to go in the quarter. Brent Fleck. Oh, 
Costin won't get a shot off. Nope. Won't happen. Horn sounds. What a quarter for Penn State and the home folks here on their feet. Letting the Nittany Lions know how much they appreciate the effort. We head to the fourth quarter. The season's on the line for both the Nittany Lions and the Tigers. Who will remain after the final stanza? State Clark. Five zip. Princeton no answers to the zone. Ethan Long the answer. Along with Matt Trainer, a relentless approach, putting their midfielders behind the cage inverting. And they're attacking up top with TJ Malone, the senior, getting the crowd all amped up. You see the scoring run, Coach Tambroni knows. His team's got all the momentum right now, and the zone has been killing Princeton. He's also gotten yeoman's work from Chase Mullins, who's won a couple of draws here in the second half after really struggling in the first. Loose ball picked up by Princeton. Stevens, he may shoot quickly, does wide. The clock's not running in the stadium not running on our bug or the stadium. There it goes. Now it's working, but it's behind. The officials are going to have to fix that at some point. Now they'll do it. Joe Cislag, Jeffrey Hoffman, Jason McGinn, we mentioned that's our crew tonight. Good job in this game. So, setting both the shot and game clock, making sure they're in sync. Shot clock is 72, but they're keeping the game clock at 1450. You could have all the ideas offensively against the zone, but when you pack it in and you have a red hot goalie like Frassion, Sometimes could just make an offense go nuts without answers. Tigers trying to figure it out. Bring Hoffers in at X. Look how tight it is, Cotter. Mackesy had the shorty on him, but he can't take advantage of it. Here he is again. Spins to the middle of the field. Nothing doing behind the slusher. Still 30 seconds to shoot. Cameron, Mackesy, he'll shoot. 
Vastion looked like he made the save, but didn't know where it was. Or it hit a player in front. That's what it was. It hit a player in front. The way Penn State is packing it in with this zone, the only way Princeton is going to be able to answer is with some outside shooting. They're daring Princeton to shoot from deeper. Trainer over to Morin. Morin looks to dodge on the shorty. Tries to use a pick from Malone. Didn't work out that well. Winkoff. Got his hands free. Fires a shot. Too wide. He can sling it. Long. They finally pulled him. Yep. Smart. More now he looks to dodge on the shorty. Gets underneath him initially. Tough angle for Moore, tough pass. Renfleck chases it down. 15 to shoot for Penn State. Renfleck looking to dodge upfield, nothing doing. Now he shoots, scores! Plenty doing! Renfleck just sent this crowd into a frenzy. Brenfleck gets the short stick because they put the long pole on long. So everyone offensively is eating. Everyone's got the green light. And Brenfleck just wins the leverage game and the determination against Pedersen is incredible. Pedersen tries to body him up. He soaks the initial check and then that split second gets his hands free. Hammers it. Fifth of the year for the man up specialist, Bren Fleck. The beneficiary of your idea of or seeing how they're inverting the attack up top. Now you can throw a guy like Bren Fleck down low. But so much of that was also because of Ethan Long. They switched the pole matchups. They were more concerned about Long. Jeff Tambroni just said, okay, we're going to continue to attack the shorties because all our guys can dodge. Penn State is winning possessions off the faceoff, too, which they had no shot almost in the first half. It was so lopsided against them in the first half hey, off the faceoff. Hey, hey, hey. Costin, he'll spin back to his left and lose his footing. Wink off to the near side of Brent Fleck. Long, coming up field. Foley ain't giving him much. Finley, rather. Trainer, just try to shovel it. You have to worry at some point the depth of Princeton. All the injuries this season. Six starters out for the year. Shot clock winding down. Brent Fleck just dumps it into the corner. Gutty defensive effort on that possession by Princeton. Penn State's on a 6-0 run. Wellington brings it across. Mackesy, so loud in the first half, so quiet here in the second. 20 minutes without a goal for Princeton. Mackesy now at X. Stevens. Cutting Stevens shoots. No, he 
Passed off to Slusher, who misses it just wide of the corner. I thought Stevens could have shot that. And he has patience where you see him sometimes hit a twister yeah. when he's losing his angle. Yeah, had to go behind the back on that? Yes, either yeah. that or a twister. Mackesy, question mark off the top of the pipe. It's twice now Coulter has dodged this zone to get his hands free. Fresh 60 here for Princeton, so Penn State's working on a long possession on the defensive end. Tries to find somebody inside with a ton of traffic. Frassian's able to go pick it up. This zone is so compact and in tight. Malone says, let's slow it up. Waits for Mitty's trainer, Morin. Come into the game. TJ spins, gets a pick. Now he's oh now that Molshan comes back on him, but he gets a little step on him and scores. What do the officials say? Will they wave it off? They will. They wave it off in the crease. Crowd doesn't like it. We'll take another look at it. Check out the foot. It's hard from that angle off the left toe. Doesn't look like he lands in the goal mouth card, so I think that's out of the question. It's whether that oh, toe hits the... That second look, it looks like the left toe is not in the crease prior to crossing the plane. Was there a drag? I couldn't see if they had a, maybe a, a toe drag as well. So close. Mackesy trying to take advantage. Shot is high. Eight thirty-one remaining. Penn State up three. Looking to join Michigan and Hopkins out of the Big Ten in the quarterfinals. Cameron coming up to the top. No angle. Darrow, he shoots. Can't get it on Cage. Down three. Penn State was playing, man. I feel really confident that Princeton can make a run. They are scoreless this half. Fedoro gets, oh, now they break that rift out on the outside of the cage. And a great outlet to Kyle Aldridge. Behind the back pass, maybe a little much from Trainer. Stays in play, but goes to Princeton. Wild series of events here. Slusher. He wasn't going to miss that one. Round the cage with his sixth on the night. Record tying goal for Coulter Mackesy. This is an angry shot. This team has struggled offensively, but Mackesy puts a ton of giddy up in this one. What a shot to the opposite corner. Princeton is not done yet. They're down two, not three. We'll fix that when we get back.
NCAA men's lacrosse coverage continues next weekend with the quarterfinals. One of these two teams hopes they're there. The action begins Saturday, May 20th at noon on ESPNU. For more information on the 2023 men's lacrosse championships, visit NCAA.com. You're home for all 90 NCAA championships as we look at the upper bracket. One spot still to be filled. Winner will play Army, Joe Albarisi. The Black Knights of the Hudson. What a job he and his staff have done. 19 seniors a year ago, 12 that played crazy minutes. And, and Brendan Nickturn, one of the greatest players oh. in the history of that program. What a job Mullins has done. If I'm Princeton, because of the inability to break this zone, you're going to have to take chances in transition. Like I thought Gia Fercaro had an opportunity to feed that ball upfield. Stevens will shoot on the run, and he scores! The captain from Ontario putting his team on his back. They're down one. Don't let him set up in the zone. Penn State's in a groove. How do you counter? With some transition, unsettled situation, and there's no better player. Your Swiss Army knife, Jake Stevens, I featured him in the open, literally does everything for this team. And at that moment, what they needed from him was to strike in transition. And they need McMeekin to find his form that he had in the first half at the faceoff dot. Mullins has been counter-punching all second half long. McMeekin kicks it to himself. Gio on the run. Gets it to Pedersen. Pedersen clears it. You know what the craziest thing about this weekend has been? Every time you think a team is pulling away, the other team answers. You can't assume That's anything. That's like the theme of this weekend. Until the final air horn sounds. You cannot assume anything. Daro, Nakasi, getting thumped. Inside, Verdaro will get a look and score! Wow! Princeton answers, one in transition, and one against the zone defense. Penn State has been airtight inside, but the second cutter in the movement and change of formation allows Princeton to find the smallest seam. You see, Vardaro starts on the wing and then he comes to the center. Penn State defensively doesn't pass him along, and he makes it pay. Only the second tie of the Knights. That's the kind of night we've had in terms of runs. Now it might be nip and tuck. Stevens. That one bounces too high. That's the look they want. Though. Stevens understands that. Now Max, he goes from the wing to X. Penn State just packed in defensively. Frassion acts like he's gonna challenge. Stays in net. Back to Mackesy. Slusher. Mackesy, tough angle, doesn't get it to go. Bounces it high in the air. Chase for it to the end line, it's Penn State ball. Saying Posey was closest to the ball when it went out of bounds on a shot. Tremendous hustle by 43 and White. Almost a turnover. Still might be. 
Dangerous inside, instead it ends up being an opportunity for Penn State. Wow. That ball got all the way to the crease and then Princeton throws it away. A little dishevelment. And they'll blow the ball in. Right where we were a few seconds ago. Penn State trying to clear it after all that. Now it's time to settle in. Inside five minutes. All even in Happy Valley. Morin. Ops not to take the shot. Winkoff does and scores! That's Winkoff's second. And this is a thing of beauty. He's known as a shooter. You give him time, you give him just a little space. It's the pick that gives him the ability to free his hands. That pick right there. Gianfer Carroll sees absolute gas to the stick side. Winkoff's 22nd ends the Princeton run. It was an eight minute and 20 second drought for the Nittany Lions. Now they're back on top. And this has become a real battle at the faceoff dot. That time won by McMeekin. What a ground ball by him. That was an amazing ground ball. Mackesy. Down the alley. Lost by Rotoro. Couldn't handle the pass. Here come the Nittany Lions. Winkoff with the lead and the ball. Ops to pull it out. What a little clock and everything settled in. He got a ton of time. I'm giving the ball to TJ. He's your proven quarterback. He's the Big Ten Offensive Player of the Year, seven in white. He's got the lacrosse IQ. He's a senior. Let him make decisions. Pass goes wanting. Now it's a big battle, huge ground ball here, won by Princeton. Pedersen avoids the check. He'll shoot wide, but Stevens is there backing up. That's a brilliant decision by Patterson, knowing that if Penn State settles or going zone, you have the slimmest of chances to strike in transition if you're Princeton. You have to. Timeout, Penn State on the dead ball. It'll be Princeton ball down a goal, 3-10 remaining. Look at the brackets. We've been showing them all night. Worth seeing again. Duke and Michigan next Saturday. You and I will be in Albany for that one. Army awaits the winner of this one in Annapolis. Anish and Q will be in Annapolis. All these games on ESPNU. Final quarter, final matchups will be Johns Hopkins and Notre Dame. Also in Annapolis on Sunday. You and I will have Virginia Georgetown. That game is going to be offensive fireworks. Virginia is the highest scoring team offensively in the nation. Georgetown with all of that talent, Tucker Dordovic, Brian Minikis, Graham Bundy Jr., they can fill it up. But the last time Georgetown went to the quarterfinals in 2021 at Hofstra, things did not go well for them I mean, against Virginia. Everything that could go wrong did. Yes. Head coach Kevin Warren got hit by an errant shot in warm-ups, got knocked off his feet. Riley, the face-off guy, was hurt in the opening face-off of the game for Georgetown. It just snowballed from there. In his health, we saw him battle yesterday against Yale with the hamstring. Yes. He's going to have to be close to 100% because he's dealing with a buzzsaw opposite him in Petey LaSalle. Always comes to play. Taking more face-offs than any player in NCAA history, and the bright lights are never too bright for Petey. That's going to be a great game. All those games are going to be great. If this weekend is any indication of what we're going to see next weekend in Annapolis and Albany. We got 310 left to play here. No shortage of drama. 
Princeton down a goal with the ball. 3-10 remaining. They got all kinds of time to shoot on this possession. As you can see, the shot clock, 73 seconds. They had some success when they, they brought a cutter from the far side in Verdara last time to finish inside. Otherwise, Penn State is just engulfing this, this offense. Another whistle to make sure we get the clock straightened out. This is the third or fourth time tonight we've had a stoppage to... They initially, the shot clock was 73, it went to 80, now back to 73. Now we're ready to go. Let's see if they change formations. Right now they're in a 1-4-1, one, one. one behind, four across, one up top. I bet they will change the formation. Bye, bye. Schlusser now at X. Cordaro's out here on the wing. Attacks the middle of the field. Stevens. Skip to Mackesy at X. Cameron. Mackesy loses the ball with a stick in it. Loses the stick. Had the ball in it. I couldn't see who that was, Clark. It wasn't Mackesy. Whoever was carrying the ball lost it. And a procedure call then with the loose ball against Princeton. That's a huge call, two minutes to go. Ethan Long back with a short stick D-Mitty. Nothing is more important than the clock right now. The ball is gold. Penn State can run this clock all the way down to a minute left without having to take a shot. Moran loses his footing. Now he loses the ball. Princeton's got two timeouts on the board. My goodness. Marquez White almost lost it. Stays with the Tigers and they just get the clear too. Tense moments. They can call a timeout. Madelon's got two of them on the board. Tigers opt to keep playing. Final minute of play. Verdar shoots, Frassian makes the save. You can question all you want, not calling the timeout, but Matt Madelon knows his players and trusts them. And sometimes it's easier to attack Gotta come based out. on the substitution. Gotta press out, clock is winding down. Penn State doesn't have to do anything but keep possession. Got to force him to the sideline now. Malone just throws it into the middle of the field. Tigers got to throw a desperation shot. It's not going to work. Frassion ties a Penn State postseason record with 16 saves. None more important than that last save to preserve the lead and the win for the Nittany Lions. They are going to Annapolis, Paul. There was a lot of doubters on Penn State in 2023. I was one of them. After three wins a year ago, they triple that total at nine. They win the Big Ten regular season championship. And the only thing that mattered was the belief that they had in one another in that locker room to advance.
Princeton led 7 to 1 in this game early. It was going all the Tigers' way in the first half. Jeff Tambroni and his staff had to do something. They had to pull something out of the hat. They went to the zone defense late in that second quarter, and it seemed to turn all the time. Frassion was outstanding in net. You go to the zone because you believe in your goalie. The Big Ten Specialist of the Year, and he makes a monster stop there. Alex Vardaro shoots through pressure. And Frassion was amazing in his sophomore campaign, a big reason why this team flipped the script, changed the narrative, and answered the bell. Our quarterfinals are set for next weekend. Two games on Saturday, Duke and Michigan, Georgetown, Virginia, that's the first game from Albany on ESPNU. Then on Sunday, it'll be Penn State and Army. Hopkins and Notre Dame, also on ESPNU. What a weekend we have had. We're not done yet. Kark and I are going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll hear from that man, Jeff Tambroni, possibly some others. Penn State with the huge dub. Thirteen, twelve, our final. Penn State comes back to beat Princeton. They're headed to the quarterfinals. I'm exhausted, Clark. I don't oh. know about you after this weekend. Coach Tambroni, how are you feeling right now? I'm, I'm elated. I'm really proud of our guys right now. They, they uh, it was a gutty win, and uh, they could have easily just shut down after that first quarter. We weren't, nothing was really going well. So, really excited and obviously exhausted, but uh, but really happy for our guys right now. Coach, what was the thought process in the second quarter? to throw a zone at Princeton. Yeah, we, we were planning on doing it no matter what. We just felt like against Michigan, we were getting worn down in that last game. Uh, we weren't winning a lot of possessions, and we just felt like we were just chasing Michigan around. And we learned a lot from that game, and we were thankful and grateful for the for the preparation coming into this game, even though we lost. So we, we were planning on just, just throwing it in there every every once in a while in each quarter. And, you know, they're, they're a tough offense to, to stop, and we were chasing around and following in behind them. Uh, we felt like Jack Frack, as long as we gave him an opportunity um, and we could settle the game down a little bit, uh, that he would be good. And that's exactly what happened, we thought, in the last three quarters. Ethan Long came into tonight with 11 goals. He scored five this evening. Where did you see the opportunities for him to dominate? You know, he was just terrific and opportunistic tonight. You know, we just we felt like guys like Jack Trainer and Kevin Winkoff and 
uh, TJ Malone, we're going to have to leave. But, you know, in games like this, you're going to have to find somebody, somebody out there that's just he's played well throughout the course of the year, but this stands up and creates his own legacy in, in playoff games. And, and today it was Ethan Long, and he's practiced really well this year. Last year he was terrific for us. Um, he just hasn't been as productive as a goal scorer, and today he just took care of his opportunities. He just was really op opportunistic. Coach, you talk about the things that weren't going right for you at all in the first quarter. Winning faceoffs was one of them. And Chase Mullins, I thought, he just kept battling and fighting. And he was one of those kids that had a much better second half. Kind of what was the message with him, or what was what were you thinking with him as he was coming off and, and McMeekin was winning all those draws? Yeah, it was tough. I mean, he had he had two violations early, and I think you're a little tentative when that happens. I give Hudson Bond a lot of credit. He he kind of held down for us took about four or five faceoffs at the end of the second the second quarter in that first half and gave Chase a chance to kind of take a breather. Uh, Coach Horgan, I thought, did a really nice job of keeping their their mindset in the game. Um, and and like, like everything else, like we were just not very good. Prince, to, to Princeton's credit, I thought they were terrific offensively, defensively, at the faceoff X, and I think everyone just needed a collective breath, slow the game down. Um, and I think once that happened, everyone just seemed to play the way they were capable of. Well, Coach, congratulations again. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week against Army. Great. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. All right, Coach Tamperoni, the victorious Penn State Nittany Lions, our Capital One player of the game. You talked to Coach about him, Ethan Long. Look, in May, someone has to step up. The knowns are going to get defended when they get off the bus. Ethan Long came into tonight's contest with 11 goals. And this evening, he was incredible and dropped the five spot. And in second half opportunities for this guy, he sees the moment. Let's talk to 2-0 right now. Ethan, congratulations on the W for you. When did you feel like you were going to have a game where you were going to be able to score goals like you did five goals on the night? Um, I don't know. I didn't, really didn't go into this game knowing that I was going to have five. But credit to the offensive players out there with me just creating space. I was just able to finish them. Ethan, describe what it's like to be in a zone. I don't know. I don't really shoot many shots from behind at X during practice, so I don't know. I guess I was in the zone just hitting everyone. How about number seven finding you as well? Those first, like, I think at least the first three goals, Malone assisted. So obviously you two had a thing going where he was finding you all night. Yeah, TJ's insane. I mean, his eyes are always up. He's finding everybody, so he's amazing. Ethan, describe the the game plan because offensively I saw a lot of flip-flopping in terms of midfielders going behind the cage and attackmen going up. Where was the point of emphasis in that? Um, a lot of it was just man-to-man uh, -man matchups and trying to beat those guys and then um, just play at X, just trying to figure them out, try to catch them off guard, going drifting, coming over the top. So I thought it played well to us. Ethan, tell me about the mindset on the bench. You guys were down seven to one early. Kind of what was the chatter? What was the what was the talk about with the team at that point? Uh, just needed one more possession. Uh, keep playing our game, no matter what. Ethan, I have to ask you this question because of the turnaround of this team. Three wins a season ago. You triple that with nine. You win the Big Ten regular season championship. What was it about this team in the off season that gave you the belief that an opportunity like tonight would present itself? I mean, the leadership was really good this year. I mean, just passed down from class to class, and especially from those guys last year. And we just put our head down when nobody was looking, and it's working out pretty well right now. Ethan, congratulations on a big night, five goals, and most importantly, the W. You guys are heading to the quarterfinals. We'll see you then. Sir, thank you. All right, Ethan Long, our Capital One player of the game. Let's take a look, another look at our brackets once again. Our quarterfinals are set. Kark, you and I are heading to Albany. We got Georgetown of Virginia. And then if we survive that one, <laughs> we've got Duke and Michigan, and Michigan's another great story this year. We got, look at all the great stories there. You got the Blue Bloods, but you also got Army. You got Penn State with the tournament. You got Michigan first ever tournament. You think about the turnaround of the Wolverines. They didn't win a Big Ten game a season ago. They win the Big Ten championship, the tournament, and now they're in the NCAA tournament. They win their first round game. They are rolling. It's going to be a fun weekend. Kark and I will be back to wrap things up after this.